Hello, let us go on with our lecture on multi-loop renormalization. Today we will begin with a new section of our lecture. The section will discuss the relationship between green functions and the Lagrangian or the action of quantum field theories. So far, we have dealt with green functions alone or green functions, even Feynman diagrams in isolation. We have discussed how to regularize Feynman diagrams and then to renormalize each individual Feynman graph. That means we know how to obtain from a given multi-loop Feynman diagram a finite remainder, for example, in dimensional regularization. We know that the uh, uh, renormalized expression is analytic in epsilon. We can take the limit epsilon going to zero and what remains is a C-infinity function in all the momentum and the mass variables of the theory. We also did uh, encounter some slight relationship to Lagrangians because um, we saw that the subtraction of divergences indeed corresponds to a counterterm Lagrangian, which is local and corresponds to a Lagrangian quantum field theory. That means the way we treated renormalization here, for example, in our convergence proof of section three, directly is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the Lagrangian treatment where you set up perturbation theory in uh, the presence of a regularization like dimensional regularization. You use gelman lohs theorem and the Wick theorem to generate Feynman diagrams using tree-level Feynman rules and counterterm Feynman rules. And what you get from this is uh, exactly the same as what we get here from our general treatment in alpha parametrization of the renormalization um, recursion formula. So indeed, uh, Lagrangian field theory in perturbation theory works and corresponds to this renormalized setup that we have discussed here. But uh, the relationship to the Lagrangian was not really worked out in any detail, but that is the central point right now. So let me write down the section title. This is uh, section five, renormalized quantum field theory and relation to the Lagrangian. You might also say a more precisely relationship to the action of the theory, but uh, that is of course essentially the same. So let me write down uh, three items that I want to discuss in particular in this section. Um, one item is the so-called quantum action principle. As the name suggests, this is a very general relationship indeed between green functions and the underlying action or the Lagrangian of the field theory. Then there is uh, the topic of Ward identities and Slavnov-Taylor identities. To some extent, this is then a consequence of the quantum action principle, but it goes into the direction of describing symmetries on the level of the quantum field theory. So um, you know uh, from classical field theory and classical mechanics that there is the Noether theorem, which um, governs a relationship between um, conserved quantities and symmetry. So it's a very, very powerful and extremely important theorem. And likewise, on the level of green functions, what in slavnov taylor identities are the expression of um, symmetries in the quantum field theories. Then uh, another uh, third item are equations of motion. And obviously, this is also something you are familiar with from classical mechanics and field theory, namely from the Lagrangian and from the action by minimization. You get uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations, which are the equations of motion governing the dynamics of our physical system. And uh, so there are some counterparts for these equations of motion on the level of green functions or operators of the quantum field theory which are nice to know 
and they fall into this section of the relationship to the action, of course. So these are three general um, items that we want to learn about. And um, of course, if you don't know uh, what the first two mean, then um, this will be the topic of uh, today's lecture. Let us begin. The first subsection, 5.1, um, will be called generating functionals. This is a technical section, which is, however, extremely useful and powerful. As you will see, these generating functionals allow you to speak about quantum field theories in a very powerful way, because uh, the generating functionals are building blocks or, let's say, quantities, uh, which give you in, uh, it's one single quantity, which gives you the complete information about uh, your quantum field theory. So any equation which is formulated in terms of such generating functional is an extremely powerful equation which uh, governs uh, all aspects of your quantum field theory. So and uh, there is a first sub subsection which is on the first generating functional Z of J. Okay, so there will be more generating functionals, but the most basic generating functional will be called Z of J, and let me now define it. It can be defined on three different levels, as you will see, and let's jump right into it. Um, the first definition is the most basic one, and it is the following. I use the language and the um, notation of our quantum field theory one lecture. So it's the vacuum expectation value in the full vacuum of the interacting theory of the time ordered product of an exponential of i times uh, the integral over d 4 x j i of x times phi i of x, and then again the vacuum. So what does that mean? Let me not write down everything, but let me explain it uh, here in words. The uh, capital phi i's are full interacting Heisenberg picture quantum field theory operators. So these are the very basic, very complicated uh, operators in our full quantum field theory. So uh, the theory might have been fully quantized, renormalized, whatever, or non-perturbatively defined. This is the exact quantum field theory. That is the exact vacuum, the ground state of the full interacting Hamiltonian. And these are, as I said, Heisenberg picture fields which satisfy certain equations of motion and commutational relations with the full Hamiltonian and the full momentum operator of the theory. So these are the basic um, objects. And uh, these, uh, so i uh, is an index, so that these phi i run over all types of fields in our theory, maybe the photon field, the electron field, the Higgs field, whatever. Then for each such type of field operator, we have a so-called source. This is a source for um, the respective um, quantum field. And uh, this is a number-valued um, non-operator function. It is a test function, mathematically speaking. It's a test function, uh, which is um, sufficiently uh, differentiable and continuous. And such that you take uh, that you are able to take functional derivatives with respect to these sources j here. So maybe I just write it in a different color. These are the full, let me just say full field operators. And by full I just mean the Heisenberg picture field operators of the interacting theory. So this is a fully non-perturbative expression, and these are sources 
mathematically they are test functions. Then what, uh, and as actually, let's put here a constant, some arbitrary normalization constant may be put in that could be uh, useful later, um, doesn't really matter much. But the point is now that if you take functional derivatives with respect to these uh, sources j, then from the exponential function you get uh, into the front some products of field operators. And if you then set the sources to zero, then the exponential function goes to one, and what remains are all these products of field operators that you have generated by taking derivatives. That means it is a generating functional in the sense that derivatives with respect to j generate for you all green functions of the full non-perturbative quantum field theory. Okay? So therefore, this object here on the left is a number-valued functional of these test functions j, one test function for each type of field operator, and it contains the information of all green functions of your quantum field theory. Therefore, this is a very powerful object. Good. And as you know, let's say these non-perturbative or exact green functions of the full theory, they are really basic building blocks of any quantum field theory. Uh, they would be uh, covered by axiomatic quantum field theory, for example, the Whiteman axioms of quantum field theory. They speak about those green functions here. So they must exist in any reasonable uh, quantum field theory for sure. And those green functions here and also axiomatic quantum field theory in general is um, defined without um, mentioning any Lagrangian. So in principle, a quantum field theory does not need a Lagrangian. A a Lagrangian is not a necessary or fundamental property of a quantum field theory. And so if we stop here, then there is no relationship to a Lagrangian. There only are green functions and maybe some operator relations. However, as you know, all important quantum field theories, which are, for example, used in elementary particle physics, and uh, not even only in particle physics, also elsewhere, uh, are based on Lagrangians. So the Lagrangian gives us a constructive recipe or constructive definition of a concrete quantum field theory. And then, of course, if we define a concrete quantum field theory via Lagrangians and actions and canonical or path integral quantization, then uh, there will be some relationships between the resulting green functions and the fundamental Lagrangian of such quantum field theories. Now, therefore, we can now uh, write down uh, the relationship of those exact green functions to the Lagrangian if we uh, are in one of two situations. The first situation where we can relate it to a Lagrangian is perturbation theory. So in perturbation theory, we um, give ourselves a Lagrangian split the Lagrangian into a free part, which is canonically quantized, and an interacting part, um, which then appears via Gelman-Lowe's formula and Wick's theorem in Feynman rules and gives rise to Feynman diagrams. Then the basic uh, step or the basic connection between Feynman diagrams and the Lagrangian and the resulting green functions is the Gelman-Lowe formula. Therefore, what is then necessary here uh, is the numerator of the gelman law formula, which would be the following. Okay, so what does that mean? gelman lowes formula tells us that um, a green function like uh, those ones here with Heisenberg picture operator is given by a fraction numerator divided by denominator. And in the numerator, you have an expression with a free vacuum 
and then three field operators quantized in the free theory and an exponential, time-ordered exponential of the interaction Lagrangian. Uh, and then uh, as many field operators in the front of the exponential F as you want to have in your green function. Therefore, if you now take again a functional derivative with respect to J of that expression here, then you will get uh, a certain number of uh, small phi prefactors in front of the exponential, and that gives you exactly the numerator of the Gelman law formula. That gives you the, exactly the numerator of the Gelman law formula. And the no, denominator of the Gelman law formula is the same expression, just without any field operators, which would correspond to this thing directly with j equals zero. So you get from this generating functional then both the numerator and the denominator of the Gelman law formula, and therefore you can reconstruct again all green functions of your theory. Let's write down the first, uh, the third option, namely the path integral. The path integral allows a very, very elegant formulation of quantum field theory where we directly quantize uh, without splitting the Lagrangian into a free part and an interacting part. And uh, then we can also define green functions we are the path integral formalism and we can define a generating functional in a very, very beautiful and uh, compact way. So the path integral over all field configurations, so this curly D phi means path integral over all field configurations of the field um, fields phi. And then we have an exponential of I times the full Lagrangian plus j i phi i, and uh, that's it. So now, uh, if you take the functional derivative with respect to j, then you get here as a prefactor in front of the exponential, again, some factors of phi, and then this is the definition, the path integral definition of an expectation value, time ordered of uh, the corresponding phi operator. So again, this gives back exactly this uh, very same expression here. Now let me point out uh, different ranges of definition and validity of these equations. So I wrote here an equality, and maybe I should say here also a constant prime prefactor, which is irrelevant and drops out in all applications. But anyway, um, but the equalities uh, hold under special circumstances, not in complete generality, so uh, because the right-hand sides have a different range of validity. As I said, this would correspond to the exact quantum field theory, which is independent of a Lagrangian. And uh, we can define this even in quantum field theories where no Lagrangian exists at all. In that case, of course, the other two lines are meaningless. The second line is valid in perturbation theory. And as uh, I stressed in quantum field theory one, uh, this perturbation expansion can only be really derived and is mathematically well defined if we do a regularization and renormalization procedure. So this expression as it stands can literally be only be taken seriously if we are in some regularization, for example in dimensional regularization where D is unequal to four, then these expressions are completely well defined and uh, in that sense they are equal uh, in the sense of perturbation theory to those green functions, order by order. Um, on the regularized level, and then also uh, if we correctly include here the counter terms into this interaction Lagrangian, then the limit epsilon going to zero exists for that, and uh, in that limit it would agree here with the renormalized green functions, um, order by order in perturbation theory. Then the path integral is in principle non-perturbative. However, the path integral is mathematically not uh, completely well-defined, in particular not here at this point in the lecture. The path integral uh, is meant here in a formal way. 
That means we write down the integral and hope that it uh, makes mathematical sense. However, we do not pay attention to actually what is the definition of the path integral measure and does it converge and what are the details of this definition and so on. But uh, on this formal level, the path integral is tremendously useful as you will see, so uh, we will leave it at that and uh, we'll make some comments on the precise definition later on. So, but in that sense, these equalities here are valid. Okay, and that defines our generating functional and now let me write down finally the formula that I have already mentioned. So, the green functions are now obtained in the following way. Let's say a green function like this phi 1 of x1 and so on phi n of xn. This would be one specific green function with, let's say, n different field operators at n different space time points. It would be obtained from either of the three lines in the following way. In the denominator, we have uh, anyway z evaluated at j equals zero. Here, this gives uh, the numerator, uh, sorry, the denominator of the Gelman law formula, the sum of all vacuum diagrams, and in the other cases, it just gives the correct normalization so that this constant prefactor drops out. And in the numerator, we have the following, namely for each field operator, we must take a derivative of the generating functional. So we have n derivatives. Let's write it explicitly. First derivative, d, functional derivative, d by d, i times j1 at x1, then functional derivative with respect to i times jn at xn of z. And after we have evaluated all these derivatives, we put j to zero. And then this gives us the numerator of the Gelman law formula, or it gives us uh, the correct expression here or here for the green function. So this is the formula for green functions if we are given the generating functional. So that is the way the generating functional contains the information of all green functions in our theory. So it's a very powerful object and it has these three representations with different meanings, but of course uh, the overlap is in perturbation theory on the regularized level, all of the three uh, Definitions are completely equivalent. Very good. Now let us go to the next step. The next step are composite operators. Um, composite operators. What are composite operators? Let's write down a few examples. As a general notation, I use, let's say, curly O sub I for some composite operator, and such composite operators might be a field strength tensor F mu nu of X as an operator, or the energy momentum tensor T mu nu at X as an operator, or for example in uh, a scalar field theory where you have a scalar field phi, you might simply take phi square of X, or if you want phi to the power eight of X, why not? Um, or also some more complicated operators, for example you might have D'Alembert phi uh, square overall. This is um, at space time point x. Or fermionic operators psi bar psi, such as spinner product at x. Or this whole thing 
square, and so on. So in general, a composite operator is an operator which arises from multiplying elementary operators, right? So all of these operators that I wrote here are products of uh, fields at the same space-time point. So the field strength tensor uh, arises from derivatives and also products of uh, vector fields at the same space-time point. This is, in any theory, um, some combinations of products of the uh, fundamental fields of the theory. And the common feature of all these points, uh, operators, is that they are local, so they depend on one single space-time argument, but they arise from the multiplication of um, several fields. And now you know mathematically that each field is like a distribution. Uh, you, you might strictly say a field operator is an operator-valued distribution, and multiplying distributions at the same point is not permissible, at least not in general. Therefore, as it stands, all these expressions are ill-defined. Uh, we don't know what they mean mathematically because they um, might be divergent or uh, undefined. And uh, so therefore, this is not obvious uh, what that means. But of course, clearly, you like to talk about those objects because these are quantities which you see all the time in your Lagrangian, and you might want to uh, study also operators corresponding to those Lagrangian objects very clearly. And of course, you want to have an energy momentum tensor um, also on the operator level in any quantum field theory, which is Lorentz invariant. So what does that mean? Uh, in very loose terms, what that means is that these operators are initially undefined but um, any such operator must be defined in the following way. It should be a local operator. That means it satisfies all the locality properties of any quantum field operator, which means that it commutes with other local operators at space-like distances or anti-commutes in the appropriate way. It has the correct properties with respect to Lorentz or Poincaré transformations. Um, so in that sense, it behaves no different from all the elementary fields. Also, all the elementary fields have uh, locality properties with respect to commutation relations um, and Lorentz transformations and so on. And those composite operators must have the very same locality properties which correspond and which reflect this uh, single space-time argument. But then what does it mean to say phi to the 8, phi square and so on? So the point is, um, and that is a practical recipe to define such operators, so we must define them. They are not defined uh, intrinsically. We must define them. And we uh, want to define them in such a way that uh, to the largest possible extent, the operator reflects what is written here. And what does that mean? So uh, it can mean, for example, and that is what we will use as a definition, um, it's three-level green functions agree with um, literally the green functions of what is written here on the right hand side. Okay. So that is what is really meant by this. So why is this a difficulty? Let's just take the very, very simplest composite operator of all that you can imagine phi square in a field theory with a scalar field. Then uh, let's say, what would be the Feynman rule for simply uh, the expectation value of phi square at the space-time point x? Just like this. What is the Feynman rule for that, let's say, in the free vacuum? Um, 
then uh, I mean you can literally apply a Wick's theorem to this in a free theory even, and uh, Wick's theorem tells us that this is this Feynman diagram, where you start with a line at point X and end with the same line at point X. So that means even this single expectation value in the vacuum of this composite operator gives rise to a one loop diagram. And this one loop diagram is of course divergent. That means uh, this operator, as I said, has not a well-defined expectation value, not even in the vacuum, and therefore it's as it stands not well-defined. However, you could look at uh, some three-level green function, for example, uh, phi, so this is one loop, but let's look at um, phi of y, phi square of x, and phi of z. Okay. Then here you have your composite operator, and here you have some elementary field operators. And let's just evaluate the time-ordered uh, green function um, of this expression, which contains our composite operator. And then Wick's theorem gives you several Feynman diagrams. Let's briefly write down all of them. So the first Feynman diagram is a contraction from y to x and then from x to z. And the second uh, big contraction goes from y to z. And then from x to x. So and this appears twice. Right, and now you see uh, one term is a one-loop expression, and it is again divergent because it contains this vacuum expectation value of the composite operator. But there is a three-level part, and the three-level part is interesting, and that is, of course, finite. So, and what I say now is that you want to define an operator which corresponds to this somehow, and which is defined in such a way that it gives the same three-level Feynman diagram but that the loop diagrams are somehow cancelled by renormalization, of course. That means these composite operators must be defined via some renormalization procedure. And then uh, it is also clear, like always in renormalization, that there is not a unique choice. You can define these composite operators in different ways. That means at three level, uh, the value of the green functions is fixed. So let's say the operator at three level has fixed properties. But at higher orders, you will have ambiguities like you always have in renormalization theory. But those ambiguities are very specific ambiguities and they might amount uh, to somehow adding or subtracting local counter terms to your Lagrangian. Um, and the exact properties of these ambiguities might certainly be figured out in uh, the theory of composite operators, but there will be ambiguities. And uh, in order to then fully define the operator, one needs to fix some scheme choice, let's say, and one example could again be the MS bar or MS scheme in the context of dimensional regularization, which means that you say, I define the uh, composite operator such that all the green functions have the values which result from minimal subtraction. That means I would define the composite operator such that uh, this Feynman diagram is replaced by its minimally subtracted value. And that also is replaced by its minimally subtracted value. And that remains because it's finite. And then we effectively define all green functions, in other words, all expectation values of this composite operator, also in combination with all other composite operators or elementary fields. <coughs> 
That would be one possible scheme, which is actually uh, really very often used in practice, but it's not the only scheme. And uh, another remark, so in this ambiguity and fixing ambiguities, you might also want to take into account symmetries. For example, of course, you might want to define this operator such that it um, satisfies some conservation equation or that this also reflects some gauge invariance properties and so on. So let's just say um, we may impose, for example, symmetry properties on this scheme choice. Now, there is a lot of theory available on composite operators, so these are studied very well, and you can imagine this because obviously you see here some examples of composite operators which are really very interesting for physics investigations and um, interesting reflecting uh, fundamental properties of your quantum field theory. Um, However, this is not the topic that we want to discuss here. I will only give you some brief references on where you can find more information on this more general theory of composite operators and such um, investigations like how to impose symmetries on the renormalization of composite operators. But my point here is a little bit different, but let me first change the batteries. So let me just write here a few references which are interesting in this respect. So there is a very rich theory of composite operators available and one aspect is uh, the famous operator product expansion. which is very often used in quantum field theory applications and you can find information on that in uh, all advanced quantum field theory textbooks. And the other thing is uh, renormalization properties. And here I'm referring in particular on things like um, gauge invariant operators. For example, F mu nu should be somehow gauge invariant or gauge covariant. Also psi bar psi in some theory might be gauge invariant. But there could also be a so-called BRS invariant operators in the BRS formalism. And uh, then BRS invariant operators can be BRS invariant without being gauge invariant. And then there is some extra BRS. So this, uh, everything which is gauge invariant is also BRS invariant, but not the converse. Therefore, uh, there are interesting operators which are only BRS, but not gauge invariant. And then BRS non-invariant operators. And uh, so uh, the point is that these gauge invariant operators, they are really the physical operators. This is unphysical and this is also unphysical. And uh, then in the renormalization, there is a mixing between these operators and the mixing has somehow a block a diagonal structure uh, in such a classification which is studied. Similarly, there are operators which vanish by applying field equations. So for example, uh, here that is not the case for any of them, but uh, let us assume 
you might have an operator b mu f mu nu minus j nu. You call this an operator, then this is a non-trivial operator and you might insert it into green functions and calculate expectation values of that. But at the classical level, uh, using Euler-Lagrange equations, that would be zero. However, what does that imply for the green functions of, of this? It's not obvious. And uh, so that is all studied. And uh, let me give you two references. One very old reference. One very old reference by Jok Le Carr and Lee from 1975 on uh, the renormalization theory of these operators. It's a 100 page paper uh, which contains um, an extreme amount of detail. Then there is a more recent paper by Benecke, Saffron and collaborators with the following preprint number. Which contains a loophole to some older theorem. And uh, I mentioned this reference because of course it refers to the old theorem which is still very important. And it gives an update by finding one particular way around that theorem. But uh, of course, uh, the old theorem is still very important because it applies in many cases, but they found a case where uh, the conditions on the theorem are violated, but which is nevertheless interesting. So these are two references which uh, give more details on such issues. So as I said, I don't want to go into too much detail on these interesting points because what I want to stress instead is that we can fully integrate the composite operators into our general treatment of green functions and renormalization such that uh, treating composite operators is no different at all from treating any other elementary green functions or any other renormalized Feynman graph that we have discussed so far in the lecture. And that is very simple, namely we can define um, uh, new or we can include them into our generating functionals. We can include composite operators into the generating functional. And let me give the final formula first. That was the end uh, in the previous case. Namely, we can define a generating functional Z, which now depends on two kinds of sources. J, the sources for the elementary fields, which were called capital Phi before, and Y, sources for all the composite operators that we are interested in. Then, uh, such that we can obtain a green function, full green function of, let's say, some elementary fields, phi1 of x1 and so on, some uh, composite operators, let's say, o1 of y1 and so on. We would obtain this in the following way. Again, in the denominator, we have the generating functional at j equals zero and y equals zero. And then we just take derivatives with respect to j for all the elementary fields and derivatives with respect to y for all the composite operators. So it would look like this. Functional derivative with respect to i times j one of x one for the field capital phi one and so on and then functional derivative with respect to i times y1 of y1 and so on. All of this act on the generating functional z and after taking the derivatives 
we put all the sources to zero. Okay? So in that way, um, the composite operators and the elementary field operators are treated on a completely equal footing. Namely, um, there is one source term or one uh, test function for each type of composite operator and the functional derivative with respect to those uh, so-called Y sources will uh, pick out a composite operator and functional derivatives with respect to J pick out elementary fields just like before. So this is then a completely unified treatment. And in order to achieve that, we simply need to uh, add the source terms also into the Lagrangian. So we would write into our Lagrangian uh, such a term, a source yi, which depends on x, and a composite operator oi, which also depends on x, and we take a sum over all i, in other words, over all composite operators that we are interested in. There are infinitely many composite operators in principle, but we are not always interested in all of them but all composite operators we are interested in and of which we want to have green functions uh, should be put into this Lagrangian here. And then the generating functional can be defined in the three ways as before, namely up to a constant. Um, it's the full Heisenberg picture expectation value of the exponential of i times the integral over the sum of all the j's times the elementary fields plus all the y's times all the composite operators. Then this generates exactly that. Okay. And always a sum is implied and everything here depends on the coordinate x. And in perturbation theory using Gelman law and Wick's theorem, this could be written as the free vacuum expectation value of the exponential of i times um, the 4x of the interacting Lagrangian. Um, and now you could, let me write it explicitly, uh, plus again all the yi times oi's plus all the ji's times the phi i's. And uh, sometimes uh, this could be combined to a new L int which contains those terms. So sometimes one includes it into the Lagrangian, sometimes one doesn't. But either way, you can write it in these two ways. And now the difference is that here, the OI is this three-level expression that we mentioned before, right? So the operator is defined via some renormalization procedure. This has now a clear meaning because here into the Lagrangian, which is in the um, uh, Gelman law formula, we have first of all the three-level term, which is what we want. And then we might have here some higher order contributions corresponding to counter terms. Because uh, this Lagrangian, which appears here in the Gelman law formula, is the bare Lagrangian on the regularized level, including counter terms. Similarly, we can write the path integral representation. So that's the path integral representation. And again, uh, you might either include those new source terms for the composite operators into the full Lagrangian or not, depending on what you like better. So these are the three definitions and the same qualifications apply as before. So this is a purely perturbative expression which is defined on the level of a regularization procedure like 
dimension unequal to four. And uh, this formula uh, will contain counter terms here in this exponent, counter term Lagrangian, and maybe also counter term contributions to this. And the path integral has the usual uh, ambiguity due to the measure being not completely well defined. So, and uh, as I said, the um, composite operators are now fully renormalized like any other term in the Lagrangian if we simply set our new Lagrangian um, L, let's say full, is equal to the previous Lagrangian plus all these uh, terms yi times oi. Then there will be a bare Lagrangian which is uh, the full three-level Lagrangian plus counter terms. And uh, the counter term Lagrangian contains now terms which are proportional to those sources for the composite operators. So the counter terms will contain stuff like this, um, yi times counter term contributions to the operator OI. And let me just make this um, a little bit transparent in an example. Let's take the composite operator curly O equal phi to the fourth. Then we would simply integrate this phi to the four um, operator into the Lagrangian. That means we would now take our full three-level Lagrangian as the previous one. For example, in phi to the four theory, we would say one half d mu phi square minus m square over two phi square minus g over four factorial phi to the four. That is our normal Lagrangian. And now we simply add plus y times phi to the four. And this y is an x-dependent test function, which now appears in our three-level Lagrangian. Then we can calculate Feynman diagrams, Feynman rules in the completely normal way. It's just that there are some additional Feynman rules involving this y. But uh, actually, the y doesn't appear in any different way compared to the normal coupling constant. So it uh, uh, doesn't give rise to any new structures or any new um, treatments or a new formalism. It's just integrated in the old existing formalism. And if we now have counter terms or the bare Lagrangian, then this would contain um, the usual counter terms for uh, the first line here. And it would contain maybe a lot of counter terms and uh, any kind of term proportional to the test function y. So the bare Lagrangian will now contain the test function y times something, times what? So it starts at three level with this. And then just without calculation, you know that in the theory of renormalization, uh, what happens is that you need um, to cancel all divergences. You need only local counter terms, but you typically need all counter terms which are local and which are compatible with your symmetries and which are compatible with power counting. That means in this particular case, what you should expect is that you need all kinds of counter terms here which are dimension four objects because this is a dimension four object and therefore you will expect here a sum of all other dimension four objects which you can write down in the theory. And let me just write it. So you would expect here some delta z phi to the four times phi to the four. So the operator itself times uh, operator renormalization constant. But that's not all. You could also have delta z um, phi to the four comma b 
which would be the following b mu phi square, the kinetic term, because that is also a dimension four object. So this could arise here, but that's even not all. You could also have delta z phi to the four comma c, for example, phi d'Alembert phi, because phi d'Alembert phi is also dimension four object, which is not the same as that one, even though they are related by partial integration, but here you cannot do partial integration since you have the x dependent prefactor y. Therefore, these are two independent objects which you can write down here. And maybe you can write down even more. And what that means is that here you have now completely renormalized your operators. This uh, bare Lagrangian will give rise to finite green functions of everything in the theory, including finite green functions of this composite operator phi to the four, if you take such functional derivatives. And you might um, say that the square bracket here corresponds to the renormalized version of the composite operator, where this is the three level uh, value of the composite operator, and these are counter term contributions to the composite operator which are defined in some regularization renormalization scheme, which are needed to generate finite uh, renormalized green functions of this operator. So you see you need special extra counter terms, the specific to each composite operator, but they can be treated in a uniform way, just like we can treat any other term in the Lagrangian. Therefore, we are now able to treat green functions of composite operators as well, and we know that we can make them finite too. So after having introduced composite operators, we will do a second generalization of our generating functionals. Namely, we will introduce new generating functionals W and gamma. Let's jump right into it. We define our functional z of j and y um, as the exponential of i times another functional w of j and y. And if we do that, then um, the interpretation is that our functional z generates the full green functions and in terms of Feynman diagrams, it corresponds to all Feynman diagrams, including disconnected diagrams and including vacuum diagrams like the denominator of Gelman law. But this corresponds to connected Feynman diagrams. Including disconnected and vacuum diagrams, W corresponds to connected diagrams. So it, um, let's say, contains the more essential part of the information. Let us prove it by example only. So let's take the second derivative, for example. The second derivative, d by di times j at x1 times derivative d by di times j at x2. And let's do it just for a simple theory with one kind of field, a scalar field phi of z. And uh, let's just uh, ignore the y because they are anyway at this level equal to j behave in the same way. Um, then, at the end, we should set j equals zero. So let's apply the two derivative operators now to this exponential, e to the iw, and at the end, we put j to zero. So what is the result? If we take the first derivative, 
the first derivative of the exponential, of course, takes uh, from chain rule, we get i times the derivative of w with respect to i times j at x2 times the original exponential. Okay, that is the normal chain rule applied to this exponential function. And now we can apply the second derivative and this, uh, now we need the product rule. So we get one term from the second derivative here, we, uh, which means we get the, let's say, um, d by di times j at x1 times d by di times j at x2 acting on i times w times e to the i w plus um, then the uh, second derivative acting on the exponential. That gives a product, um, d w derivative with respect to j at x1 times d w with respect to j at x2 times e to the i w. And then at the end, the source will be put to zero. Now, let us just check the diagrammatic interpretation and see how it works out. Uh, if our diagrammatic interpretation is correct, then what we have here means the following. This bracket is the uh, um, second derivative of W with respect to two sources. So it should generate all connected diagrams. So what that would mean is that we have here a two-point function, x1, then all connected diagrams to x2, then times that. And what this is, is the full generating functional z. And if the sources are zero, then this precisely means the sum of all vacuum diagrams. Then the second expression here is a product, so that would be a first derivative of w, which is a one-point function in this interpretation. So we have here x1, just ending in a blob, all connected diagrams of this type, where uh, one line goes into a blob and then into nothing, times a second expression of the same kind, And then again, this is multiplied with the sum of all vacuum diagrams. So, and now you see here the structure which is emerging. Our full derivative of the full functional, which was supposed to give the sum of all diagrams with two external points, x1, x2, is now split into the following expression. Namely, the sum of all connected two-point functions times all vacuum diagrams times the product of two one-point functions which are disconnected, and again times all vacuum diagrams. And this is precisely the most general structure that you can have for any Feynman diagram combination which gives rise here to the left-hand side. Therefore, in this example, we have established this correspondence, and let's not do more on this, because uh, this would really be topic of quantum field theory two or something like this and there is plenty of literature on this connection. So let's just take it for granted for our purposes here. So we have introduced the second generating functional W, which um, um, has a more minimal information content and corresponds to the connected diagrams. And the appearance is very similar uh, and uh, actually also very simple, namely in the exponential. Okay, very good. But now let us introduce yet another generating functional which is way more interesting and also more complicated to define and to discuss, namely the generating functional gamma, and that corresponds to the one particle irreducible diagrams and therefore has an even more minimal information content and is even more useful, for example, for renormalization because there we like to deal with one particle irreducible building blocks because they really contain the essence of what needs to be done in the course of renormalization. So how can we define this generating functional gamma? We need to take two steps. 
in the end, it's defined via a Legendre transformation, like when you go from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian or back. So first we need to define the variable uh, with respect to which we do the Legendre transformation and then we can actually do it. So the Legendre transformation is done with respect to the sources J, but not with respect to the sources Y. And therefore now for the first time there is really a significant difference between the treatment of these and these, between the elementary fields and the composite fields. You see, in let's say axiomatic quantum field theory and Whiteman axioms and so on, there is actually no difference between composite operators and elementary operators. There is no such thing as an elementary field or a composite field. There are just fields. There are local field operators. They are all treated on the same footing. They all need to satisfy the same axioms, um, which we mentioned also before for the green functions of composite operators. But um, you cannot distinguish on a fundamental level between composite and elementary. But you can distinguish once you have a Lagrangian and once you have canonical quantization or path integral quantization, because then there are elementary fields for which we will specify canonical commutation relations or elementary fields which are the integration variables in the path integral and the composite operators are everything else which you can build out of those elementary fields. So once you have a Lagrangian, there is a significant difference and now the Legendre transformation is done with respect to the elementary fields and the source is J. So how can we do it? We can define vacuum expectation values or let's say, uh, sorry, expectation values in general namely expectation values of a field, an elementary field operator in the presence of the sources J. This can be defined now by taking the functional derivative of the generating functional with respect to I times the source J at X, but without putting the source to zero. So actually it's in the presence of J and Y. And uh, so the sources take any value that you want, space-time dependent, x-dependent, but you take the functional derivative once, and then this defines an object. It defines the expectation value of your field uh, as long as you don't set the sources to zero. So this is some complicated expectation value which is uh, defined in your quantum field theory now. Okay, and this is now defined as a variable. Let's call it small phi classical. Let me call it phi classical. It depends on x. This also depends on x and uh, the x dependence comes from the functional derivative. So if the sources are space-time dependent, then uh, this expectation value will probably also be somehow space-time dependent. So, but anyway, uh, once you are given the sources, you can compute this object and I call it phi classical because of course it uh, is a classical field uh, arising from an expectation value of certain field operators in the presence of some very complicated sources. And now the Legendre transformation is between this uh, source J and the new classical expectation value phi. So basically you can flip the variables, you can either take the source as uh, the input and the expectation value as the output, or vice versa, you take the expectation value as the input and you compute the source as an output which is required to give your um, desired expectation value. So this is the Legendre transformation that we do. And in this sense, we define now gamma. This depends on uh, such variables let me call it phi classical, and of course there are as many um, such uh, phi classical objects as there are field operators in your elementary fields. 
We do not do a Legendre transformation with respect to the Y sources. Therefore, they just remain as arguments in the generating functional. And then the definition is, uh, let me get the signs right, W of J minus the integral uh, over space time of J I times these uh, phi I classical objects sum over i, of course, and the integral is over d4x. And this is evaluated at the value j, which corresponds to this, uh, or sorry, vice versa, phi classical is equal to, um, ah, uh, sorry, I forgot here a factor. Let's divide by uh, z of zero. And if we divide by z of zero, uh, this would be the same as the derivative of W with respect to the source, and so I can just write the W derivative with respect to J. So this is the Legendre transformation. Uh, w and uh, the product evaluated at this point, which is exactly a repetition of this definition here. And there is the inverse Legendre transformation going back to the variable j and y. So y is just a spectator in this, in this uh, operation. Then we have here gamma of phi classical comma y plus this integral expression. And then we have here the inverse j is equal to minus the gamma uh, functional derivative with respect to phi classical. Okay, so this is the Legendre transformation, which defines our generating functional gamma. And so gamma uh, depends now on uh, the same sources for composite operators, um, but classical expectation values of your field operators and you can take functional derivatives with respect to those. And the claim is that this is useful because that gives you one particle irreducible green functions. So let me just write down uh, important properties of gamma. Very basic property A is if you have a gamma, um, that Let's put it that way. The functional derivatives um, let's just say this gamma generates one particle irreducible green functions evaluated with the Lagrangian L, which depends on the uh, field operators plus the classical field that you put in. What I mean by this is um, you take functional derivatives of gamma with respect to all the phi classical and the y variables, and uh, then you set the, the variables to some value. In the simplest case, you set the sources to zero. So you set phi classical to zero, and you set y to zero after taking the derivatives. Then it means you simply evaluate the green functions uh, with the normal uh, field um, put into the Lagrangian. However, you can also do something more general, namely you evaluate the functional derivatives and afterwards you put 
the classical field in the functional to some value that you want. And then it corresponds to one particle irreducible green functions where you take into the Lagrangian first this replacement, then evaluate new Feynman rules after this replacement. This uh, gives a shift to your field, generates new linear or quadratic terms in your Feynman rules. And this, um, with these changed Feynman rules, you can evaluate one particle irreducible green functions again. But uh, so this covers the most simple situation where after taking the derivatives, you put everything to zero and then it corresponds just to the ordinary one particle irreducible green functions. So that explains you why this generating functional is so important. There is a second reason why uh, it is so important, namely gamma is equal to the classical action d4x of the full Lagrangian um, plus higher orders in h bar. So if you count loops, then three level uh, means that gamma at three level simply is the action, the classical action of your theory. And uh, if you evaluate it on the regularized level, then this would be the regularized action in d dimensions or without regularization in four dimensions. And if you have sources, then this Lagrangian would contain all those source terms and so on. But uh, in general, gamma is uh, the classical action plus higher orders and therefore the name effective action. So this is of course a very, very important role of this generating functional which uh, gives rise to very interesting uh, interpretations. And the special case of this is one can also look at an effective potential, which is the um, classical potential plus higher orders. If we go to constant fields, so gamma, where all the fields are now equal to uh, constants, of x, right, then uh, all the kinetic terms go away. So for example, here in this classical action, there are no kinetic terms anymore. There are only potential terms, like Higgs potential, Mexican head potential, think of this. Uh, that remains, but the kinetic terms go to zero. But there are these higher orders, so these correspond to quantum corrections to the classical potential. Um, and in momentum space, you need to split off a momentum conserving delta function, but then you can define this to be minus an effective potential of all these fields times um, a four dimensional delta function of momentum conservation. Loosely speaking, of course, so that delta function would be infinite. You need to split it off before taking the limit of constant fields. But then in this way, you can really define very beautifully an effective potential. And uh, that is important, for example, in the standard model. At three level, the Higgs potential has a Mexican head shape. And uh, this gives you a precise definition of quantum corrections to the Mexican head potential, which are calculable in this way by one pi green functions evaluated in such a way. And um, uh, that is of course interesting to know because the Mexican hat might change its behavior due to quantum corrections, which is a very interesting field of study actually. Okay, so these are three important properties. And for us, of course, the most important one is uh, the fact that gamma contains the one pi green functions and uh, that makes it the elementary quantity to consider in the evaluation of loops and of renormalization theory. Let me now give some references where you can, can find more information on all these topics. So in particular, the French quantum field theory books are very good in this regard. So I can recommend it six on super. And also uh, Zinn Justin, 
These are two very detailed quantum field theory books. Uh, that one is much more advanced and also contains a lot of connections to condensed matter theory, but uh, is really a quantum field theory textbook, which is very, very strong and deep on renormalization theory. It's Exon Super is a standard quantum field theory textbook, which also contains a plethora of details, and both of them explain all these functionals in detail. And uh, so I think for our lecture here, I do not uh, want to go into much more detail. Let us only illustrate the whole thing by, again, one or two examples. Uh, using this gamma. So first, let's go into the vacuum. Examples. The actual vacuum of the theory on the functional level corresponds to the source j equals zero. That is our vacuum, and uh, therefore, if j is zero, then this corresponds to one particular value of our phi classical, namely, at j equals zero, our phi classical is given by the functional derivative dw with respect to j at j equals zero, so that really corresponds to the vacuum expectation value of, uh, of our field operator. So this is the actual vacuum expectation value of the field operator. So it literally corresponds to this. So that is really what that is. So it's the actual vacuum expectation value, which is uh, maybe non-zero, which is governed by the dynamics of our quantum field theory. Okay, and now uh, using gamma, what does it mean? So uh, the Legendre transformation read backwards. Where is it? Over there. So phi classical is this, but the source J is given by the uh, opposite derivative. So it means in this case, zero is equal to the derivative d gamma with respect to uh, phi classical at the vacuum expectation value. What does this equation tell us? It is a functional equation which determines the vacuum expectation value of your field and the form of the equation is extremely similar to the principle of least action. So this is the effective action, classical action plus higher orders, and this is uh, the functional derivative, which is uh, the same what you would do if you minimize the classical action. So here, uh, what this tells you is that the vacuum expectation value minimizes the effective action. So this is analog to the principle of least action. But it governs here the vacuum expectation value of your theory. And by the way, this also means that uh, if the vacuum expectation value is space-time independent, so it's a constant, everywhere in space-time it has the same value, then of course you can go to this level where you have the effective potential, and then this would tell you that uh, the vacuum expectation value minimizes the effective potential, including quantum corrections. And that is then the reason why this quantum corrected Higgs potential defined in this way is so important, because that would really give you the actual vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field in the universe if you take into account loop effects. So that is very interesting and um, very important. And of course, in many cases, the vacuum expectation value will be zero. And if it is not zero, you can make it zero by redefining your field operator uh, by subtracting this constant vacuum expectation value. This doesn't change commutation relations, so you can redefine your field operator by a constant. Doesn't really matter much. So you can also assume without loss of generality that all your fields have zero vacuum expectation value but you can also live with non-zero ones. Anyway, let us now assume the vacuum expectation value is zero to simplify the rest. 
So let us assume that all such vacuum expectation values are zero. That means if the source J is zero, it corresponds to phi classical being also zero. That is the simplest case, and as I said, you can always arrange for it. And then let's look at the second derivative. Let's look at the second derivative. And uh, how should we do it? Yeah, let's look at the second derivative and take the connected two-point function, which would be given by the second derivative, second derivative with respect to i times j at x and i times j at y of i times w, and uh, at the end, put all the sources to zero, and let's ignore the y sources because they are not important right now. But anyway, let us now put in the Legendre transformation. What happens if I put here the Legendre transformation? I will get, first of all, uh, this derivative. Uh, and first I apply the derivative with respect to y, then I get dw by dj at y, which is the classical field. So I get here the classical field evaluated at y. That's what I get. Okay, so I have a strange expression, namely the classical field, which is interpreted as a functional of j in terms of this derivative, um, which is uh, taken derivative of with respect to j. So, but this is, of course, the inverse of the opposite derivative, 1 over i, times the inverse of the following derivative, dj of x derivative with respect to the classical field at y um, in the sense of functionals, which means in the sense of convolutions of functions. Um, and then if we evaluate this derivative, then we can plug in j is given by the derivative gamma with respect to phi. So we then have here in the numerator d by d phi classical at y. And this is then minus derivative of gamma with respect to phi classical at x, because that is j according to the Legendre transformation to the minus one. And then we have here a second derivative of gamma. So at the, in the minus, so this is just i, times the inverse of the second derivative of gamma with respect to two such classical fields at x and y. And as I said, the derivative is to be understood in the sense of convolutions. Right. What does it mean? So if our interpretation is correct, uh, that this is the sum of all one particle irreducible Feynman diagrams, then this is now the following. So we have here the inverse of the sum of all one particle irreducible diagrams. Um, and at three level, we simply have, let's say, uh, this kinetic term. Um, well, let's do it in the other way around. Uh, let me go on here. Because we know that all the connected diagrams to the two-point function can be written like this, i divided in the scalar theory, i divided by p square minus m square plus the self-energy at p square. Let's just do it for a scalar theory. So we know that from quantum field theory one. And then these are all the one particle irreducible higher order diagrams. And this is the three level propagator corresponding to the kinetic term in the Lagrangian. And now we can compare it to this. And we see that uh, the second derivative of gamma with respect to two fields is given precisely by this denominator. So that's our second derivative of gamma. So that means at higher orders, the second derivative of gamma generates the self-energy, which is one particle irreducible. And at three level, the second derivative generates this, which we so far didn't view that as a one particle irreducible expression, but it really corresponds to one if you would take the kinetic term of the Lagrangian um, 
second derivative of phi minus m square times phi square, and literally view this as a Feynman rule, then that would be the value of this Feynman rule corresponding to such a vertex corresponding to the kinetic term of the Lagrangian. So this really explains uh, both of these features, namely gamma generates one particle irreducible green functions. That is definitely the case uh, at higher orders and at the tree level, it gives you back the tree level Lagrangian or the tree level action. And so we have illustrated uh, both features here in this way. And you can go on and take third derivatives, fourth derivatives and see how um, gamma appears in a natural way such that you see that uh, all connected three point and four point diagrams are split into one particle irreducible building blocks and so on. So it comes out very naturally and you can see examples and also more general discussions in those books. So let us not uh, go much more into detail of this, but let me just tell you once again that all three functionals are important. We have a functional Z for general green functions with all Feynman diagrams. We have W for the connected diagrams and gamma for the one particle irreducible diagrams and gamma at the same time is the effective action and contains the effective potential. And now we have relationships between full green functions on all these levels and the Lagrangian um, via the path integral and via our perturbative expansion. And also here we have a nice relationship between gamma and the three level action. And now this will allow us to derive relationships between green functions and uh, actions and derive properties like word identities, slavnov taylor identities, quantum action principle and equations of motion for green functions. So that will be the next subsection. Uh, sorry for the previous five or 10 minutes. I was a little bit under pressure because I knew the battery would uh, run out any second. So, but now I have fetched new batteries, no time constraints anymore. Um, but here I would just like to give you one additional example. Uh, okay, or let's put this up too. So the previous example was that in the vacuum, um, uh, J is zero and then the vacuum expectation value of our field is given by d gamma by d phi equals zero, like principle of least action. And then we can assume now all the waves to be zero. That means that um, our one particle irreducible diagrams calculated with a normal action, uh, depending on the standard field in the usual parametrization, uh, this generates one particle irreducible green functions which uh, give rise to our gamma. And then we have um, looked at the two point function. The connected two point function is given by derivatives of gamma with these um, I factors. And then we thought this is the same as I times the inverse of the second derivative of gamma. And that corresponds to this denominator here. So we see this relationship between tree level and higher order one particle irreducible diagrams um, and our second derivative of gamma. Now here is an example for a three point function. Let us just go through it step by step and then you can see that for higher point functions the same uh, mechanism would also be at play. So we begin with a three point function where we take into account all connected Feynman diagrams, one particle irreducible or not. And let's uh, look at the definition in terms of W. So in terms of W, it would be the third derivative of W with respect to three sources J. And each source is multiplied with an I and W is also multiplied with an I. And then this gives the usual Feynman diagram normalization where each Feynman diagram naturally also is multiplied with an I. Let's look at the end. At the end, we get this for the same three point function. Namely, it is split into the following. We have one, one PI block in the middle, and then this is connected to three external lines. And at each external line, there is an arbitrary number of uh, complicated 
connected Feynman diagrams. So every connected Feynman diagram can be put into this form where you have some random corrections on each external line, but then at some point the three lines must be merged and you can always identify a one PI block in the middle. So every diagram can be split into this structure or in other words, uh, the full connected green function can be factorized in this way into a connected two point function for each external line and a one PI block in the middle. So we would know this a priori by just analyzing structures of Feynman diagrams. And now this structure completely emerges when we go from gamma, uh, from W to gamma. So let's see how it works. We have a third derivative of W. We already evaluated the second derivative of W and the second derivative of W with respect to these two sources J gives rise to the inverse of the second derivative of gamma. With these factors of I, so I, 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 there is one overall I here and no I's in this. And then this is an identity for the second derivative. Then the third derivative now has to act on top of this. By the way, of course, this already explains one of these external lines because this is the full connected two-point function as we saw before, so it corresponds to one of the external lines. But let's go on taking the next derivative, the i cancels here. And then we can use the chain rule. So the chain rule is applied in this sense because that is now a functional of the phi classical. We take a derivative with respect to j, so let's do a chain rule. Let's say uh, d by dj is equal to d phi by dj times d by d phi. It's a normal chain rule, and then uh, the d by d phi acts on that. But the chain rule is now uh, meant here in the sense of convolutions, because everything is a functional derivative depending on some coordinate x. So we have here an integral over x prime, where we have this chain rule here, d by phi classical at x prime, phi classical at x prime, and then here the functional derivative with respect to j at x. And then this derivative acts on to that one. And this is something new which we have to evaluate. Now, what is the result of this? Yeah, this is what we evaluated before because that's the inverse of the opposite derivative and so it's the inverse of the second derivative of gamma again. And now from here on I only use abbreviated notations so that would be the second derivative with respect to two phi's with those arguments. So it's a much shorter notation, makes much clearer what is actually going on. So this is actually equal to that according to our previous calculation on the previous blackboard with arguments x, x prime. And here we have two to the minus one. Then here we have a derivative so it's all functional derivatives with arguments and so on, but uh, it behaves in the same way as normal matrix derivative. So we have a derivative of a matrix with two indices with respect to something else with an index. And the matrix is uh, taken to the inverse. So here we already in our semantic um, calculations, we had something like this d by dt of an inverse matrix is given by minus the inverse matrix times d m by dt times the inverse matrix. So it's a matrix um, derivative rule that you can easily derive. And we can literally apply the same formula also for functional derivatives. What do we get then? We get um, two times two factors of the inverse matrix so two times the factor of the inverse matrix is this gamma uh, second derivative, this gamma second derivative inverse, uh, and we have a matrix product. So in other words, we have a convolution integral over new variables y prime and z prime. Multiplied with a derivative of the matrix with respect to uh, whatever we have here, and that gives here the third derivative of gamma with respect to three phi's with arguments x prime, y prime, z prime. And here there is a minus, which you can find also here. That's it. And then you have the structure, three times an inverse two-point function and a non-inverse three-point function. And if we reinstate all sorts of i's, then you can write it like this. i over gamma, i over gamma, i over gamma times i times a three-point gamma. And that is exactly the explanation. Because this i over a two-point gamma means 
uh, the resummed one pi uh, green functions, which give rise to the full two point uh, function for to the full um, propagator, including all quantum corrections. And here in the middle, we have this three point function. So this corresponds to the one pi block in the middle. And those are the three um, factors for the external lines. And all the i's are correct. So it means that such an i times gamma corresponds to the one pi part of a Feynman diagram, including all the i's. And as I said, you can go on and take fourth, fifth derivatives, and uh, that is also explained in the books that I mentioned before. So it all works out, and you can just convince yourself, and you can also formally derive it at all orders, that uh, gamma generates the one pi green functions, and it corresponds to three level plus um, higher orders, or a three level action plus higher orders, um, to give rise to this interpretation as an effective action. So all of this is very beautiful. And now let us finally go on and derive some properties where green functions are really related to Lagrangians because this is all preparatory in nature. Let us now seriously come to relationships between green functions and the classical action and the Lagrangian, potentially including counterterms. As I said, I want to mention in particular three such relationships, the so-called quantum action principle, equations of motion, and Warden's lovnov taylor identities. And the way we'll do it is the following. First, we will look at the path integral, which is formally defined, not really defined, because the path integral measure has not yet been clarified. But um, we will look at the formal path integral and derive on a very, very simple level powerful relations which um, um, make manifest the three properties I mentioned before. So these properties are then established on a form level, which means we have not really proven that they are valid, but we have an idea how such relationships might look like, and uh, potentially we can give actual proofs of such properties later. That is the idea, and in fact, as you will see afterwards, all the properties that we will derive now on the path integral level with very simple derivations. They remain all completely valid in dimensional regularization on the regularized level as long as we have d unequal to four. So dimensional regularization provides a regularization scheme which is extremely nice in the sense that you can view it as a definition of the path integral where all these beautiful path integral properties are actually completely valid. Although of course, um, on the perturbative level, diagram by diagram, while the path integral might be also defined in a non-perturbative way. But with these uh, restrictions, dimensional regularization gives full proofs of all the relationships that we will derive now. So the idea of these relationships that we will derive now is that the path integral derivation is super simple. So you should always memorize the path integral derivation because it is so elegant and so powerful. And as you know, you should only remember that the result is correct, even though maybe the starting point is somewhat ill-defined. Okay, so what are those relationships that we are now looking at? Let's do it at the level of the full generating functional Z. This is now defined in this generic way as a path integral over all field configurations for the elementary fields, which we use in our definition of um, canonical quantization or path integral e integration variables. Then the integrand is the exponential of i times the action plus, um, yeah, let's say, uh, this, let's call it L full plus the sources J 
times phi. So now this L full contains um, potentially counter terms. It contains definitely uh, the terms yi times oi for all uh, relevant composite operators. And these are the source terms for the elementary fields. So this defines our generating functional and maybe there is a constant prime as a prefactor which has no field dependence. Now let us derive the first property. Let us simply say we do a field transformation So all elementary fields phi i of x undergo a local um, transformation. Let's say phi i of x goes to phi i of x plus delta phi i of x, which is a small variation. And we might give it in a more elaborate name, let's say, we could call it, um, let me call it epsilon, um, but this is now a new epsilon here just for this particular um, derivation. Epsilon times some composite operator oi of x. Okay, so what I want to say with this is that we have an infinitesimal field transformation which is definitely local, so uh, the field transforms into some other fields defined at the same space-time point x. And maybe the transformation is a product of fields, which means it's really a composite operator. And it's a small variation, and we take only infinitesimal such variations. Therefore, I put here the parameter epsilon, which is uh, independent of our previous epsilons that we had. It's only appearing right here. And an example could be a scalar field phi could go to phi of x plus epsilon times phi square of x. That would be a non-trivial composite operator, but you could also have a linear transformation. Phi of x goes to phi of x plus i epsilon times phi of x, or in other words, it goes to itself times one plus i epsilon, okay? So this would be like a phase transformation. Okay, so this is an infinitesimal phase transformation. Phi uh, is a complex field and it is multiplied with a phase e to the i epsilon and the phase is very small so we can do a linear expansion. And that would be a linear transformation where the right hand side is uh, also just a linear expression in all the fields in this case in the uh, single field that we have. Here we have a nonlinear transformation where phi goes to itself plus a variation which is however nonlinear and therefore a composite operator. We allow all these cases and therefore this is what we write. So the uh, shorthand notation would be simply delta phi, a longer version would be some composite operator. Okay, long story short, we have a field transformation and we now study what does the path integral do under such a field transformation. And we simply assume now that the path integral measure, which we anyway have not defined, um, is invariant under this transformation. Okay, it's an assumption. Let's use this assumption and then do a derivation. Then we have z of j and y is equal to this constant prime times the path integral, d phi exponential of i times integral over the full Lagrangian plus j times phi. And now we use that the measure is invariant, which means Let's call the right-hand side here phi prime i of x. And then we can just 
say the method is invariant, so d phi is the same as d phi prime. And um, Uh, okay, uh, sorry, let's, let's go back. Um, let's not do it yet. Um, let's change variables completely. Then we have d phi prime everywhere, but it's now a new variable, so this depends on phi prime, and here we also have phi prime. But now we say, so this is an identity because we have just relabeled phi into phi prime with this is uh, actually no change whatsoever. But now we can plug in phi prime to be this variation of phi. Then it is still an identity. So then we have here, let's call it an abbreviated form, phi plus delta phi. And here we have j times phi plus j times delta phi. And now comes the non-trivial part, namely we assume that the measure is invariant, which means that the path integral remains the same if we simply replace the measure d phi prime by the measure d phi. So, but the integrand remains the same, and now the integrand has a non-trivial dependence on delta phi. Okay, so this is an identity which is non-trivial because of the last step uh, with the measure. But now we use that the transformation is actually infinitesimal and we make an expansion. First order in the deltas or in this parameter epsilon here. And then what happens in first order, so the exponential function is just the product of all the exponentials. So here we have exponential of j times delta phi, e to the i times j delta phi in first order of this just gives the following. So we just get a factor one plus integral i times j times delta phi. This is what comes from the first order approximation of this term in the exponential. Then there is an additional delta phi dependence which we should expand in. So L full depends on delta phi and we only want to take the first order term. Maybe we can do it in two steps. So here we have then the exponential function which only depends on E times the integral L full, and this L full can be now written as L full of phi plus, um, let's say, functional derivative of L full with respect to phi times delta phi times the variation. This gives the first order term here. And then we have plus j times phi. Okay, and now here we have again isolated um, explicit delta phi dependence in the exponential. So we can also expand in this first order, then we get constant prime times d phi, and we can combine it one plus i times j delta phi plus integral d l full with respect to d phi times delta phi, all of this in bracket, and that gets multiplied with, this is a product, times the exponential of e to the i integral L full plus 
j times phi. So now we have several terms. We have a term with one and a term linear in delta phi. The term with one is just path integral d phi of the exponential, and that is identical to the left-hand side. So here we have isolated one uh, part of the expression which is equal to the left-hand side, plus some additional term. The additional term is precisely the linear contribution in delta phi, which therefore must be zero for the left and right hand side to be equal. Let's make it explicit. So this is constant prime times the original set of j and y, which comes from the one term, and which cancels against the left hand side. Sorry, that is integrated. And then plus the following constant prime times path integral of i times, let's do it like this, i times the integral over j plus d l full with respect to d phi times delta phi multiplied with this expression. So therefore, we have arrived at a path integral expression, left-hand side equal right-hand side, that cancels. And that means that this path integral here must vanish in order for the left and right-hand side to be equal at first order in delta phi. This is explicitly linear in delta phi. So that must be a zero. And actually, we, uh, delta phi is infinitesimal but arbitrary. Therefore, we can take yet another functional derivative with respect to delta phi. Then this is gone. And uh, so remember that this is an integral over some space-time coordinate x, which appears here. And afterwards, uh, this is not there anymore. And we have just here uh, the x-dependent prefactor. So from, OK, sorry for the small break. But we have derived that the left-hand side must be equal to the right-hand side, which means that the second line here vanishes. Now let us bring the second line into a nice form. The linear part in delta phi has two terms, namely j times delta phi and uh, this functional derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi times this uh, variation delta phi. So let us define um, this more clearly as this integral over the full Lagrangian, which is used in the path integral. Let's define this as an action, S full. It, this S full will include the same source terms, y times composite operators as this or it might include counter terms and so on and so forth. So it includes everything. And then this uh, second term here is the functional derivative of the action um, with respect to the field times uh, the variation. So then we can write the second line in the following way. Zero is equal to the path integral d phi integral i times j times delta phi. That is one term. And the other term is this variation here, i times delta s full with respect to phi times delta phi. And all of that is inserted into the path integral. You can also rewrite it once again. Let me write it down below. Since the path integral defines, of course, expectation values, 
in the presence of the sources here, so we can write everything as an expectation value in the presence of sources, J and also Y. And then uh, the expectation value is taken of the square bracket. So we have one expectation value, integral J times delta phi, and one term I times this. This is the identical expression, just written in a slightly different way. Good, and what we have here is the general formulation of the quantum action principle. general quantum action principle, however formal. So we are not yet sure whether it's true or to what extent it is true on the renormalized or regularized level. But uh, that is the path integral derivation of this very general relationship. Let us derive um, yet another version of this by going to explicit green functions. So let us look at this uh, on the level of elementary green functions to get a further illustration. Okay, so elementary green functions are just obtained by taking derivatives with respect to the source is j. So let's take some derivatives. With, with, let's assume there is just one source j, but we take many derivatives at space time point x1 up to xn. Then all these derivatives normally generate green functions uh, of the elementary field phi at those points. And now we act with those derivatives onto this identity. And that will give us identities between individual green functions. After taking the derivatives, we set the source to zero, of course, like usual. And then what do we obtain? So let us act with n j derivatives onto this expression and set j to zero. So there are now two terms. Either the derivatives act on this or on that. And remember, there is always the exponential being multiplied here. That's hidden. So if we take this term first, we act with many derivatives uh, with j on uh, this and set j to zero. So if j is zero, then that term would go to zero at the end unless one of the j derivatives annihilates the j here. So that means in order to get something non-zero from this term, precisely one out of the n derivatives must act on this factor, then delta phi remains and all the other j derivatives act on the exponential. So all the other j derivatives then pull down one explicit elementary field phi. So from this kind of terms, we get the following. On the left-hand side, we get zero, and then, so let's say first, the x1 derivative acts on this, and all the other derivatives act on the exponential. Then we would get the following p product of delta phi at x1, because that derivative acts on this and generates the delta phi. The integral cancels and the i also cancels. Then all the other j derivatives uh, pull down appropriate phi's. So we get phi of x2 and so on up to phi of xn. And uh, that's it. Then we set the sources to zero and that really generates the vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product of this expression where this is now, once again, such a composite operator, potentially. Then we get many more terms. So we get one term where j at x2 acts on this. Then we would get here delta phi of x2, and so on. And the last term is when this delta j x n acts here, and the others act on the exponential. That would give us time order product of the elementary phi x1 up to elementary phi xn minus one, and then delta phi at xn, 
and uh, from this um, term here. Okay, so we get lots of green functions where we have many elementary fields and one of the fields is converted into a delta phi at the appropriate argument and we get this for each of the phi's. That all comes from here and now we get something from there. So when we act with the J derivatives, they have nothing to do with this because that cannot depend on J. So therefore all the other J derivatives here act on the exponential. They pull down lots of phi factors and they are just multiplied with this. So therefore we get an additional term plus T product of many elementary phi's, phi x1 and so on up to phi xn times whatever we have here, which is i times delta s full functional derivative with respect to d phi times the variation delta phi and that is inserted into the green function. And now this again is such a composite operator because that is for sure somehow a nonlinear expression in all the fields. So uh, this combination is a nonlinear co uh, product of fields and therefore this is a non-trivial composite operator which is evaluated at which argument? It's evaluated at the argument. Um, uh, it's of course integrated over. Uh, sorry about that. It's integrated over. So this is, um, maybe I should have highlighted this, but this is integrated over the space-time argument of that field here and so here as well and so here as well. Okay. So, but it's a composite operator, it's integrated over and uh, then this is a green function with many elementary fields and one such composite operator. Now, that is our identity. This, this is the general quantum action principle. So it's a relationship between many green functions with elementary fields and uh, an insertion of the variation of the action which we use in the path integral. Okay, so somehow it is a relationship which um, comes from um, the action which defines the theory. And so this is the most basic relationship that we will derive today and all the other ones like what identities, equations of motion, they are essentially corollaries of this with um, maybe more appealing physical intuition. But nevertheless, also in this form, it is a very useful statement. And so these two statements are identical just uh, the left one is written in a more explicit form. The right uh, version is written in the language of the path integral or uh, generating functionals. Now let us do these corollaries. What identities, Lovnov taylor identities and equations of motion. Let us start with the equation of motion. That would be property two. So on the classical level in a field theory or in any um, Lagrangian theory, you know that the equations of motion are derived by the principle of least action. So let us just write it down once again. So the functional derivative of the action of your theory with respect to some dynamical field that is zero and uh, the solution of this equation gives you um, the field configurations which can be realized actually. Okay, and now what do we have here? Let us use in our property one a very trivial field transformation and then use the quantum action principle to derive something like equations of motion on the level of green functions. Namely, let us simply use 
our variation delta phi being a um, number valued uh, field. Let's say a test function. So then um, all the previous equations are still completely valid. So here at this point where we assume the field transformation, this is not a complicated composite operator which depends on dynamical variables. It is just a number which is uh, a priori given from us with some x dependence which has nothing to do with the path integration. Therefore, if we go to the end of the calculation, we can take this literally and here we have now our delta phi, which is a test function, which is given by us. It's not the result of the integration. It's not integrated over. It is just external. And therefore, we can take that equation and take a functional derivative with respect to this test function delta phi. Take functional derivative with respect to this test function delta phi of x of the previous equation. And what do we then get? We get a simpler equation which reads like zero is equal in that notation over there um, simply j or i times j with the argument x. The integral goes away and uh, j has now the argument x from here. And the second term, also there is no integral anymore, but we simply take the functional derivative of this action, which we use in the path integral, functional derivative with respect to the field on which the action depends, phi, and evaluate this at x. And that is zero. So, that's it. This is now a path integral version of the equation of motion because what you see here is that uh, the, uh, yeah, the stationary action, if you want, um, is not zero, but if you insert this uh, variation of the action into a green function, then it gives zero green functions um, up to uh, the sources j. So if the j sources are zero, then the green function involving this operator is really zero. But if the j's, uh, the sources are non-zero, then this does not directly give zero, but this particular combination still gives zero. So that is really the generalization of the equation of motion. So in that sense, the equation of motion is fulfilled on the level of green functions. How does it look like on the explicit level of green functions? It would look like this, that here always the functional derivative of that, this would simply give a delta function. So a delta function of delta of x minus x1 times the green function with all the other arguments. And here delta function of x minus xn times the green function with all the remaining arguments. And here the green function with all the arguments times um, an insertion of the variation of the action. That would correspond to uh, the equation of motion on the level of green functions. So it's a less trivial identity than this one, more complicated structure, but not much more complicated, but this is the direct expression of the equation of motion on the level of green functions. Very nice. Finally, property three. Ward and Slavnov Taylor identities. What and Slavnov Taylor identities are expressions of symmetries on the level of green functions. 
And here again, in this lecture, I do not want to develop a full theory of symmetries in quantum field theory, which is a topic on its own and deserves its own lecture, and that would correspond to something like quantum field theory too. But here, let's just assume that we know what symmetry transformations are. Um, and uh, the transformations look like this. But uh, the difference is that in, that in the case of a symmetry, we have an invariance. So here we just had a field transformation, but uh, we had ab absolutely no idea whether the theory is invariant under this transformation. In the case of a symmetry, we have such a transformation, and it might really be um, involving non-trivial composite operators here, such nonlinear expressions like that, or a linear phase transformation like this. But a symmetry um, is when uh, the Lagrangian or the action is actually invariant under this transformation. So let us now assume the uh, action is invariant. And in this notation, we simply have the functional derivative of the full action with respect to the field times this particular choice of the field variation gives zero. And of course, uh, in the general case, we might have many fields, and each of them gets some particular transformation defined in such a way. And the combination of all these transformations uh, leaves the action invariant. If we have this particular case, then we can again plug into our quantum action principle here, this general statement, and then the right part here is zero. So we get the following. We get the following identity. Zero is equal to the following. I times the integral of j times delta phi plus zero plus nothing. So that's just all. But again, let me put here the index. I put here the index and not in the other cases because here it's really important that in a non-trivial theory we have many fields and the symmetry transformations of all the fields are depending on each other and there is a cancellation. If you do all the transformations of the electron, the positron, the photon field and so on, then the Lagrangian is invariant. And so uh, you have this expression. And here still the sources might be anything you want. That is the general expression and this is the most general and most basic version of Warden's Lafnov Taylor identities. Let us also look how this looks like uh, on the level of green functions. Simply plugging it uh, over there, uh, it's literally the first line. The second line is now zero, and the first line is what remains. So we have a relationship. Zero is equal to the following p product of delta phi x1. Let me add indices here for the fields. So phi1 at x1, phi2 at x2, and so on, up to phi n at xn. So these might be different types of fields like psi, psi bar, or photon field a mu, and so on. This plus, and so on, plus t product of phi 1 at x1 and delta phi n at xn. And actually, a neat way to summarize this equation would be simply to say that uh, this is, I write it in quotation marks, but it's the expectation, sorry, it's uh, the variation of the expectation value of all these products of field operators. Let me make a box around this. This is a very important statement, the basic warden slavn of taylor identities, and let me explain this shorthand notation here. So this is meant um, you apply in the usual way of uh, product rules, you apply the variation everywhere, so this generates a sum of terms where the delta is applied on phi 1 or phi 2 or phi 3 and so on up to phi n. 
which generates exactly all these screen functions. Each screen function contains precisely one such composite operator delta phi with one of the arguments and all the others remain the elementary fields. And so if you look at this notation, then you see that what this really tells you is that if you have a symmetry of your action in the path integral, this is invariant under the field transformation phi goes to phi plus delta phi, then the green functions are invariant under the same symmetry, so in this quotation mark sense. So you take any green function, apply the same variation onto it, which means really this combination of green functions, that combination is zero. So you have an invariance relationship for green functions. These are the basic Ward and Slavnov Taylor identities. And so you see that in this simple way, you can derive all these relationships from the path integral. They are uh, easy to remember. You start with a very trivial observation, namely the measure uh, should be invariant, and then you can uh, plug in the variation, equate left-hand side and right-hand side, arrive at this result, which is still a little bit abstract. But if you put in these two special cases, either number-valued field, you get nice equations of motion in the path integral, or you plug in the invariance of the action, and then you get a symmetry relation for green functions. And uh, uh, it's obvious that it is hard to overstate the importance of such relationships. And because they are so important, I will rewrite them once again in slightly different ways. We have already written them in this kind of, yeah, maybe abstract way using expectation values with sources. This is a nicer, I think, nicer way to write it with explicit green functions, which give you an idea what it actually means. But yet other uh, nice uh, ways to write it involve the generating functional gamma, our effective action. Because you see that we start with some properties of the classical action here or there. And then, of course, it would be interesting to see how this is reflected in the effective action gamma or on the level of 1PI green functions. So let's rewrite it in this way, and then you have additional insight or additional kind of overview what relations uh, these are. And then we will derive that in dimensional regularization, all of this is literally true. Right, as I said, so let us briefly rewrite all these equations in a, an even nicer form such that it gets more physically appealing. So here I collected once again our three properties, the general quantum action principle, which is this most, most long-winded version, then the equation of motion without the delta phi, so just expectation value of j times uh, uh, plus this composite operator, coming from the variation of the action, and then the Ward and Slavnov Taylor identities, which look particularly simple, and they are valid if such a variation here or uh, such a symmetry transformation of the action vanishes. Okay, so let's go to the level of gamma and derive similar or equivalent relationships. In order to do it for all three cases, we um, need to um, uh, Add a little bit more formalism, but not much. Here, just in case, I collected the Legendre transformation and the definition of J versus the classical fields once again. Let us begin by looking at the Watt identity and Slavnov Taylor identity because that is the simplest case. So, this is the expectation value, and let us rewrite it. We have actually zero is equal to the following. Well, the j is a number valued function. It's a test function. So therefore, it has nothing to do with the expectation value here, which is uh, governed by the path integral. While that is a dynamical variable, which is integrated over in the path integral. But so we can pull out the integral over space time, j i, and then we just have this. <coughs> 
So this looks kind of innocent, but not much different. But now let us plug in the relationship between the source J and our gamma. Because if we reverse the Legendre transformation, then J is nothing but the derivative of gamma with respect to the classical field. And then this very same equation looks like follows, minus i, but the minus i is not relevant, but here we have derivative of gamma with respect to a classical field phi i. And let us now uh, simply drop the label classical, because we know in the context of gamma all the phi's are these classical field configurations which arise from taking the path integral expectation value and they are now acting as variables of gamma. So this is one of those classical fields, but let's drop the label. And uh, that replaces this, and then we simply have the other factor. How does this look like? Zero is equal to some irrelevant factor times a combination d gamma by d phi times delta phi. That is like a symmetry relation. Like the original symmetry requirement, namely zero is equal to the derivative of the action defining the theory with respect to uh, the field times the variation of the field. That was the starting definition of the symmetry that we put into the derivation of the water and slavnov taylor identity. And now see what we got. We got almost the identical equation, but with two modifications. So on the quantum level, there are two modifications. Let's highlight it. Namely, the first modification is, of course, that instead of the classical action, we have gamma, the effective action. Gamma instead of the classical action. So that is an obvious change, very expected and very nice to see it coming out here. But the second change is also interesting, namely instead of this delta phi, the field variation on the classical level, we now have here something, namely delta phi, but um, this here has now to be interpreted as an operator of which we evaluate the vacuum, ex uh, the expectation value in the presence of these two sources, J and Y. So it's clear that something like this must happen since delta phi is the field transformation. This depends on the dynamical field variables which become operators on, in the quantum field theory and then uh, having such a number valued equation means that we need to take some expectation values and that's what we have here. And now on this level I can finally explain you what is the difference between Ward and Slavnov taylor identities. What identities, in my language, we call this thing a what identity if that is a linear field transformation such that actually what we have here in the delta phi is a linear combination of elementary fields and then the expectation value of it is a linear combination of the elementary expectation values. which can then be written as a linear combination of these classical fields phi, the arguments of gamma. Delta phi i is linear in the dynamical fields. Which has the consequence that this expectation value is a linear combination of uh, these phi j's. Let me just put once again for the last time this index classical, uh, which are these arguments of gamma. So that is, in this particular case, this is really some linear combination of those 
fields which are entering gamma. And then this can be written as a uh, equality d gamma by d phi times a linear combination of phi's without expectation value. So a very simple kind of identity. So we have an equality like this. So let's say uh, d gamma by d phi i. And then we have here some linear combination. Let me just invent some abbreviation for the linear combination. Let's say coefficients a i j times phi j. This is the general form of such a word identity. So here I just plugged in this linear combination. That is how it looks like. And then there is no trace of expectation values j and y anymore. It's just uh, literally this. Very simple expression. And then actually the form of this expression is 100% identical to the form of the classical symmetry equation. That is a word identity in my language. So word identities have this special simplifying feature that from here you can further simplify to over there. In contrast, Slavnov-Taylor identities do not have this property. Here delta phi is uh, nonlinear, at least in general. So it's what we would call a composite operator. And then there is no further simplification possible. However, we might now use this formalism that I indicated, namely we could uh, couple these composite operators to sources. So let's say we have done it, then our L full would contain terms like yi times delta phi i. So we have done uh, exactly this formalism. So our delta phi i's are now some particular composite operators, and we have decided beforehand to couple those to particular sources yi. In that case, this can be rewritten. Namely then, uh, such an insertion or a green function involving composite operator can be written in terms of a derivative with respect to y. And in that case, we can go on and simplify further, and then we arrive at zero is equal to d gamma times d phi i times d gamma by d y i. And the integral is over the space-time argument of these functional derivatives. And so this is now a nonlinear identity in gamma. Okay. So you see now, first of all, the Watt and Slavnov Taylor identities can be written in this way, and already this way is a very, very nice and intuitive way to write them. And all of these identities can be written in this way, d gamma by d phi times this expectation value. And so you see very clearly these two changes, effective action and expectation value of the symmetry transformations. And then there are the two cases, linear. In that case, the identity is literally identical to the one on the classical level. And it's a linear identity in gamma times some explicit coefficients depending on phi or Slavnov-Taylor identity, where you can couple the deltas to uh, sources, and then it's a nonlinear identity in gamma, where you have such a product of gamma derivatives with respect to fields and with respect to y sources. You don't have to do it, but that is a very systematic way to write down the Slavnov-Taylor identities. And uh, let me just mention here, these identities are also known as Lie identities, namely in the book by Denner, 
Böhm, Jos, Deadbook calls these identities Lee identities, um, and uh, sometimes they are also called Zin Justin identities. Namely, the Weinberg textbook calls these identities Zin Justin identities. And actually, there were several papers by uh, also the combination Lee and Zin Justin where these identities were uh, written down in precisely this form. However, uh, the original identities by Slavnov and Taylor are equivalent to that, and therefore, in a large part of the literature, these identities are called slavnov taylor identities, and that is the language that I will also follow. So now we have simplified the Ward and slavnov taylor identities, and let us now just briefly also simplify the other two identities. In order to do that, as I said, we have to introduce just uh, infinitesimal additional formalism, notation, let's say. So here we now have some composite operators in our identities. And one way to treat composite operators is to introduce these sources. Let's say officially you introduce sources Y for the composite operators and then for the rest of your life with this theory you can um, calculate or determine green functions by taking derivatives with respect to sources Y. However, sometimes maybe you have some special composite operator uh, which appears just once in your lifetime and then you don't want to introduce these official sources for that one. Um, and that might be the case for these strange-looking composite operators involving derivatives of the classical action. And therefore, people have invented a notation also for that. So let's say um, you, what we really have over there is the path integral um, over, let's say, some operator O. Let me call it OI to make clear that it's an operator, and then the usual exponential. And uh, let's just say we have introduced sources for all elementary fields, sources for some interesting composite operators. But here we have yet another composite operator which appears just once, and we don't want to write it uh, in this way. So it just appears once. Then first of all, this is a well-defined expression, and uh, that alone would be the generating functional set of uh, J and Y. And now we have this additional uh, factor here in the path integral. It still depends on all the sources and so on. And the name for this is OI dot Z. So this is an official name for such a construction. OI dot Z, it's like a multiplication, but uh, uh, it's called an insertion of the operator into the path integral. And so that can be also expressed as a generating functional by just temporarily introducing a source for this. So we temporarily introduce let's say y i for this particularly uh, for this particular extra operator and then this can be written um, as a derivative with respect to this specific new temporary let's call it temporary to make it super clear it's a temporary additional source times i of the generating functional where we also have temporarily this additional dependence on the extra source. And then we set only this extra temporary source to zero. Okay. So in this way, you can completely integrate also the treatment of such a, such a special operator into the general formalism. But uh, the point is simply that you do not 
always carry with you the dependence on this temporary external field or source, but you do it just once. And the notation for this would be this nice product notation. And uh, now you can do go. Uh, you can go from this temporary Z to uh, temporary W, and by Legendre transformation also to a temporary gamma. And the Legendre transformation is done with respect to the J, so there is no interference with this temporary Y. You can set it to zero uh, at any point in the calculation, doesn't matter. And therefore, in this way, you can also define easily something like this, OI dot gamma, which is the same thing, namely you do the temporary source in gamma, then take a derivative, set the source to zero, and then you have defined an insertion of this special composite operator, which appears just once in your life, and uh, is inserted into one particle irreducible green functions. And then using this notation, we can write all those equations in a nicer way. So just literally, Let us write the equations in a nicer way using this formalism, using these uh, so-called insertion notations. So let us begin with the first equation. The first equation is now literally using the new notation, quantum action principle. Zero is equal to, let's factor out again the j and get rid of the i, and then here we have an insertion of this delta phi, and uh, let us assume, like before, that they are at least coupled to external sources yi, officially, let's say, not in this temporary way, so then we can really write this as d by d yi of the generating functional z. Okay. So this is this. Uh, including the expectation value. However, for this right term here, we use this new notation because this is, let's say, an operator which we insert only once in our lifetime and never want to see it again. Uh, the I has gotten rid of and, uh, okay, no it hasn't because here I cancelled actually an I in order to get this and then let's keep the I, I times integral and uh, then let's use this square bracket as an insertion. So all of this is inserted into Z, and that uh, means literally the same as this, but it is defined via this notation from before. But now we can uh, go to gamma because, as I said, um, this insertion with the dot notation is nothing but yet another derivative with respect to some temporary external field. So then this is just nothing but a normal generating functional with some derivatives applied onto it. So then for this z, we can use e to the iw for the connected functional. And then, uh, as, as you can easily see, if you put here z is equal to e to the iw, then um, the derivatives act on the w, and you get literally the same equation where z is replaced by w. Let me just indicate it here on the blackboard in this way. So the identical equation is valid if you just replace z by w by uh, canceling after taking the derivative, you can cancel the remaining e to the iw everywhere and then that's what you get. And then you can uh, replace W by the Legendre transformation. W is equal to gamma minus something else, but the derivatives which act here on that W, they uh, are blind to that, so this something else drops out, and therefore you get literally also the same equation in terms of gamma. But let me write it down in this case. So we have here integral over 
uh, j, but uh, the j can now be replaced by minus d gamma by d phi i. That makes it nicer, and here we have d gamma by d y i. And uh, that was just uh, saying that w can be replaced by gamma, and j can be replaced by minus d gamma by d phi. And here we remain with this plus i times this very same insertion, but inserted into gamma. Okay, so it's literally uh, the same equation for z, w, and for gamma, but there is this additional replacement possible. And then this is again uh, the most general equation, this quantum action principle, which is also the most abstract and maybe least intuitively appealing one. But nevertheless, this is how it looks like in the case of the slavnov taylor identity. We, uh, the second term vanishes, and therefore only the first term remains, and that corresponded to the symmetry on the level of gamma. But now in this general case, where we do not necessarily have a symmetry, just some field transformation, we get the extra term, and the extra term corresponds to the non-invariance of the action, right? So this is non-zero if the action is not invariant under this transformation. And then instead of zero, like in the slavnov taylor case, we get uh, this extra term. That's just how it is. Okay, but that is uh, an alternative way to write it. And now there are no expectation values uh, written anymore, but everything is encapsulated in gamma. Similarly, we can do it for the equation of motion. So for the equation of motion, we have here literally, first of all, ji um, times the generating functional z, because uh, this is a number. It can be pulled out of the expectation value. And then we have expectation value just of nothing, of one, which gives the full generating functional. And that is not an insertion. It's only a product, because that is a number, not an operator. Plus the second term, that is now an insertion. I times d is full by d phi i of x inserted into z. And now what happens here? So you can go again from z to w. Then you replace this by e to the i w, e to the i w. And uh, that is actually a derivative with respect to such a temporary uh, source. Therefore, from the e to the i w, you pull down one derivative of w, and one factor e to the i w remains. You can cancel that. Afterwards, there is no factor here anymore, and uh, only the derivative on w remains. And then you can go from w to gamma, and you obtain zero is equal to minus, again, here, um, the i can be canceled. And uh, that is minus d gamma by d i. Uh, and that has canceled. And here we get the insertion. into gamma. So what do we have here? So these are the two general forms. Uh, but then let's look in particular now at the last equation, because this is, again, beautiful, I would say. Um, it would be even more beautiful if I would have written this in, in that way. So bring this to the left-hand side. Let me do it on the blackboard for you. Then we simply have that. This is now an equality. How does this look like? Here you have the classical, or the uh, on the level of the action, 
the variation of the action with respect to a field. Here we have the counterpart on the effective action for the full quantum theory. And that is the same if you insert this classical object into gamma as a composite operator. So this is uh, the way the equations of motion are manifest on the level of green functions. So in terms of gamma, it is again a very beautiful equation connecting uh, the Lagrangian or the action, which is the definition of the theory via the path integral with full green functions, including all orders. So now we have a few very nice equations. The abstract one, the equation of motion on the level of gamma, the Ward and slavnov taylor identities on the level of gamma. Here are the slavnov taylor identity, which is valid if we have a symmetry. Here are the Ward identity, which is valid if we have a symmetry. Here are the general form for Ward and slavnov taylor identities if we have a symmetry, which highlights this um, object here for, from which you can see why there is this distinction between linear and nonlinear symmetry transformations. And here, the previous more general formulation. All of these equations are important and useful and are fundamental equations which give us dynamical information on the quantum field theory. And as I stressed in the beginning, our derivation is formal. It relies on the path integral having this formal property. The measure is invariant, whatever the measure is exactly. And the next step is to prove that uh, these equations are actually true in some form. So that is the next section. <laughs>